there is no magic wand. There is no magic wand that's gonna do that work for us. This is, we're fighting empire. Law doesn't matter. Our, our rights don't matter. Our lives don't matter. It really is about what it is that we do in our unity. Uh, and I think that this is a time, um, you know, take the space that you need to, to, to despair as you need, but not to surrender. I, I totally agree with you. We, the Palestinians, were not fighting Israel. We were fighting the empire. We're fighting the empire, all of it. And I, 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 I agree again with you that it is time that we, the Palestinians, sit with each other and think of new strategies on how to combat this empire, how to combat this occupation and genocide. Now, instead, I think this isn't about what the ICJ is going to say about us. This is a test for the ICJ. It is a test for the ICJ. If it can't come to this conclusion in a, after watching a live stream je colonial genocide of the worst kind for 11 months, then the ICJ doesn't have legitimacy. So hello, Dr. Uh, Noura Malakat. I'm very happy uh, that you're joining us today uh, for Palestine Deep Dive podcast. Um, how have you been doing? Hi, Ahmed. I'm happy to be with you. I have to say that like most people, I think that um, recent events that, you know, after as we approach the one year mark of a genocide against Palestinians in Gaza, besieged Palestinians in Gaza, who have been attacked by a nuclear power with the backing of world superpower. That as we approach that year, rather than see it, you know, a transition come to a close, that we see forms of accountability, that we saw a widening of Israel's attack and an escalation into Lebanon um, in a way that demonstrates very barefaced, you know, masks off that whatever international legal institutions exist in order to stem war and ensure peace and stability, whatever international law and principles exist in order to protect the sovereignty and the equality of states, in order to protect civilians, that whatever whatever this is, is it just doesn't exist. And it wasn't going to you know regulate what was happening in a way that demonstrated, quite frankly, and very sadly, mm -hmm. um, the 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 little value that Arab life generally has um, globally. So that's been very very hard. You know, you can't. But there would be this would not be possible. But for a thorough dehumanization, obviously of Palestinians, but of Arabs and of Muslims, as as this racial you know this is a racialized category, and Arabs and Muslims become collapsed. That the the diminished value of our lives that, you know, there isn't even in a, you know, there isn't this idea that, oh, we have a normal life. We have family, we have dreams. In fact, we like all people believe in freedom and are willing to fight for that freedom and have a right to fight for that freedom to see the ease with which Israel expanded its campaign has been very heavy, very heavy, heavy. And then now, you know, we, we that was total masks off in the Iranian response to Israel, which, in, you know, it had been restrained for um, much time. And to see in the response to that, that, you know, the white, the way that the White House responded was, you know, more than gaslighting, right? It was more than gaslighting that, you know, Ka Kamala Harris referred to it as destabilizing the Middle East. That, you know, a year of genocide wasn't destabilizing, right? That these attacks on, you know, uh, sovereign nations weren't destabilizing, that the, you know, appending international court of justice rulings weren't destabilizing. And yet this was, and so it's just, you know, there's a heaviness that sinks in to think about what it is that, you know, in this era, this era of history, and we have to think of ourselves in an era of history and not merely a moment of our lives, but in the stretch that will be remembered, um, you know, what What does this opposition look like and what are we up against? Dr. Noura Ariqat, you're a legal expert. And I really, uh, since the beginning of this genocide, I have been asking myself and asking my other Palestinian friends about the international law. What is the international right. law? 
where is it taking us? We have been clinging to the international law. Even us Palestinians who we speak at events, we would always call for the, the application of the international law, the equal application of the international law as it is our savior. Where has this international law and the UN and the legitimacy and all of that taken us? So I think that there's also the way that we've approached international law. Um, and as you called it, like the idea that it has the capacity to be a savior is a way to attribute to it a value and a potential that it doesn't have. International law in its inception and its development is conceived in the service of expanding empire and in you know facilitating you know um, better relationships between imperial powers as they compete over land resources territory um, and people and labor right mm -hmm. and so that that said we, international law has also had the capacity to develop and to change and to be rewritten but I think that if we understand international law as a, a historic site, and an ongoing site of domination, it tempers our expectation of what it can do for us. And I think for most Palestinians, especially, we feel that, you know, we have this belief that had international law been abided by, we would be in a different place, right? Um, sure. Had Resolution 194 been implemented, had um, Security Council resolutions, you know, I don't want to say 242 and 338 because those mm -hmm. didn't necessarily serve us as we would have wanted, but let's say, um, you know, other General Assembly resolutions, um, 3236, 3237 might have served us, must, uh, us better. Had the res Security Council resolutions that condemned the annexation of Jerusalem, we wouldn't be, been, we wouldn't have been here. Had the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination in the 1973 Convention Against Apartheid been uh, applied, we wouldn't be here. And so there's a way that we feel that international law actually does have the potential, but we just can't apply it correctly. And I think that's what creates a lot of the disappointment. My own approach to international law is the former, mm -hmm. to understand it as this site of domination and to understand that, you know, obviously it has value. Um, it has value because law is power and it can be wielded in the service of uh, emancipatory struggles of liberation struggles, if it's wielded in the service of sophisticated political movements that wield that power. So our emphasis shouldn't be on the law. Our emphasis should be on the power and how do we use the law strategically in this moment? Obviously, I think that, you know, we've used the law very strategically, that the Republic of South Africa took Israel to the ICJ is no small feat. Obviously, there's no enforcement mechanism in the international system, so it couldn't necessarily apply the decision. But the fact that Israel stands accused of genocide, right, when by its very nature, the Genocide Convention is drafted in the same year that Israel is established and, and recognized mm -hmm. at the United Nations, sets a remarkable precedent. It establishes for the first time that that it in itself is not above uh, the law. And I know that's not enough, right? I know that's not, not enough. enough. It's not enough, Nora. And I, I have been asking myself this question for a long time. If the international law did not help us and if us clinging to the international law doesn't help us Enough, to be honest. Now, I understand that what, what South Africa did in the ICJ is very important. It's It hasn't it, it didn't happen before, but it also didn't stop the genocide that our people are suffering from in Gaza. So when will this genocide end? And what can we, the Palestinians, do in order to stop this genocide and stop the occupation of the Palestinian lands? Right now, I, I'm, I'm completely honest with you. I'm, I'm sinking into the depth of despair. It feels like we, the Palestinians, have tried everything and it didn't, it didn't matter. It didn't help us. We tried the negotiations. We tried the armed struggle. We all tried the armed resistance, the, the international law, the, the going to the international courts. And none of that helped the Palestinians live. So what should we do? So I I want to just acknowledge everything that you're saying and sharing with you that none of us have escaped this despair. And I don't want to say anything on this show that tries to tell your audience that I don't think they should be in despair. This is a horrifying time. But I also think that we should separate these two topics. There's a way in which we collapsed our despair that basically made international law a greater culprit 
as opposed mm -hmm. to understanding it as one of many sites of, of, of insufficiency. It's just mm -hmm. a site of insufficiency. The media has been insufficient. The media has primed audiences to accept a large number of Palestinian deaths and now the invasion um, and this escalation in Lebanon. The media hasn't done its work. Politics and whatever power we thought that you know people had accrued has not done its work. Sovereignty in the way that you know anti-colonial movements imagined, right? Anti-colonial movements in the 1970s always imagined that being able to establish their sovereignty as sovereign states would enable us in order to recreate the world. But here we have sovereign states and the Arab world as well, right? That have, have failed us, that have been insufficient. It was revealed yesterday in Middle East Monitor that Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Egypt, and the UAE are among the countries that are fueling Israel's war with oil. So even sovereignty and the self-determination of all peoples is insufficient. And so when I talk about international law, it's not to rehabilitate it from this narrative of insufficiency, it's to temper how, what it is that we can expect from it and how to better use it as a tool. Mm -hmm. All we can do in this moment is to enhance what we do because giving up is not an option. Yes, nothing has worked to stop this genocide and to liberate Palestinians, but is the does, does the opposite of that mean that we give up or does the opposite of that mean that we act with greater strategic acumen and foresight and try to think to ourselves, how do we do this differently? How do we do this better, right? Even as you mentioned, Armed resistance is insufficient in this case. We saw in two weeks Hezbollah, a force that took decades to build, that has a, you know military armed force that you know competes with a, a, a conventional standing army, be yeah. decapitated in a, in a matter of weeks. So even here, this narrative of of what is it? What is it? And I you know I keep coming back to the way that oftentimes this is juxtaposed is to make us feel like, you know, nothing is work. And so we, we stare at surrender mm. as, as, as the alternative. And I just want to encourage all of us in here, you know, and myself as well, that's not an option. It's, it's never been an option for Palestinians. It's never been an option for any peoples who have faced an eliminationist campaign, right? We have survived and thrived this long in the aftermath of Nakba, we recuperated ourselves uh, into an organized political body. In the aftermath of Nexa, we reorganized ourselves into militant groups that constituted a radicalized and a revolutionary Palestinian liberation organization. In the aftermath of this moment, we have to have the horizon and the breath to understand that this is part of this longer history where we have to do things better, differently, um, and pivot where necessary. My own approach to that happens to be in the way that I, I'm a legal scholar, mm. I'm a legal scholar. So I spend a lot of time thinking about how that's done. You know, I'm not I'm a scholar in general, so I think about racism a lot too, you know, globally um, and critical race theory. But, I, you know, I, so I spend a lot of time thinking of like, what does that mean when we think about the law and how do we use it strategically? And I just want to emphasize if the alternative was not to go to the ICJ or to go to the ICJ, I would go to the ICJ a million times. The precedent that was set can't be understated. And in fact, it was that precedent that was set that, for, you know, again, insufficient, but it is what on what grounds, for example, we see Colombia you know, enact uh, uh, sanctions on the transfer of coal. It's on what grounds we see several countries enact diplomatic sanctions and withdraw their ambassadors. It's on the grounds that we see a suspension of arms transfers from numerous countries. It's on those grounds that we see a demand for ceasefire, even amongst, you know, Security Council member states. Um, and so it is, it's not doing the work that we necessarily want it to. But there is no there is no magic wand. There is no magic wand that's going to do that work for us. This is we're fighting empire. Law doesn't matter. Our our rights don't matter. Our lives don't matter. It really is about what it is that we do in our unity. Uh, and I think that this is a time, um, you know, take the space that you need. 
mm. to 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 despair as you need, but not to surrender. Uh, and 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 to you know, we need a deep breath and 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 to keep going, and to keep going with with some strategic foresight of what that looks like and how we can do it in in smarter, more strategic ways. I, I totally agree with you, uh, Nora. We're not. We, the Palestinians, were not fighting Israel. We were fighting the empire. We're fighting the empire, all of it. And I, 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 I agree again with you that it is time that we, the Palestinians, sit with each other and think of new strategies on how to combat this empire, how to combat this occupation and genocide. But also, b- because we are fighting the empire, I don't think it's only a fight between the Palestinians and the empire. I think it's a fight that all of us and every one of us all around the world, we have to fight. And I believe that Palestine is a test for all of us. It's a test for the Americans, for the British, for the Europeans, for everyone. So what is your advice or what do you, what are your asks from people who are following us or watching us right now in the US or in the UK or anywhere in the world? I can't agree with you more. And I think that that's why, you know, understanding Palestine is, is you know, when people say free Palestine, it's not just freeing Palestine from Zionist colonization, settler colonization. It's literally freeing, it's a call to free the world, right? From, mm. you know, in, um, interests, capitalist interests, imperialist interests that dictate our lives, that are subjecting, putting us on a course of, of climate catastrophe, which is upon us, right? As we can, as we can mm-hmm. see, that actually re- rewrites like where do we ascribe value? That we can't allow neoliberal principles to tell us the value of things, the value of our time, the value of of my my mother's affection. That has no value, right? In a neo mm-hmm. in a neoliberal um, uh, framework and compass. And so this and and that's just you know taking it to the macro level. I I will also say you know one of the things that I said initially when I was looking at the law and studying ICJ jurisprudence is thinking about whether or not the IC, you know, thinking constantly the ICJ at the later stage of proceedings is going to disappoint Palestinians, right? This was a lecture that I gave that at the later stage, yes, it decided that it was plausible, but at the later stage of proceedings, it's going to find against Palestinians because of its narrow jurisprudence and we couldn't overcome it. And that's a whole Mm. different conversation. I've changed and now I don't think that way. And because of the help of my my colleagues and friends like Professor John Reynolds, now instead I think this isn't about what the ICJ is going to say about us. This is a test for the ICJ. Exactly. It is a test for the ICJ. If it can't come to this conclusion and after watching a live stream je- colonial genocide of the worst kind for 11 months, then the ICJ doesn't have legitimacy. It can't say anything. We already know this is a genocide. So it's, it's a way in which Palestine has inverted the lens. It doesn't matter what you say about Palestine at this point. It matters what Palestine says about your legitimacy and your institution. It's the way in which the U.S. has isolated itself on the world stage. When the uh, General Assembly voted on the IG, ICJ advisory opinion declaring Israel's presence in the West Bank and Gaza, again, insufficient, when it declared it unlawful, 124 states voted for that. The U.S. was in a minority. Less than 20 states voted against that. That is, that is, you know, a very, you know, an indication of weakness. So I just, I also want to remind people that, yes, I mean, this is where I draw my hope from. I, you know, I'm just telling you the way that I see it is, you know, obviously nothing is enough, but also take take a lot of comfort in knowing that the only thing that the U.S. and Israel have at this point is brute force. There's no moral legitimacy. There's no power of persuasion. It's coercion. It's threats. It's force. It's naked, naked militant power, which is a very, very weak form of power, as opposed to hegemony where people agree with you and, and, and recreate these norms. So what do I say, what do I think that, you know, should be done at this point? The immediate thing, you know, obviously is to continue to agitate and to disrupt. Genocide is not normal and we should not normalize it. Um, and so that, that does continue. Um, but I want, we should do it in, in, in a way that's smarter, where we've built our base, where we've expanded our ranks, where we've flanked ourselves as we protect against what now 
is a counter-revolutionary force that ha we have pushed it so far, we have pushed the narrative so far that either we win or the opposition pushes back and mm. gaslights us to the point where they fire staff at a museum for wearing the kafia, yeah. right? That's how, that's how repressive it is. So, you know, to think about how do we do this where we have one another's backs in a smarter way. The second thing that I would, you know, I think just in terms of the next horizon, why this repression? It's not merely to quiet us so that Israel can get the job done. This repression is also meant, um, it's a fight over the narrative. It's a fight over how this moment will be remembered. We take for granted because it's so grotesque and our bodies feel it. Uh, this is obviously genocide. Nobody can say that it's not. But I promise you that the horizon is over how this is going to be recorded in history books, how it is going to be documented. Is it going to, you know, think about, this is not, you know, I'm, we're, think about the, you know, the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. For most people, it's been remembered as, you know, a necessary evil, right? Think about the Lebanese civil war. It's not even taught in Lebanon because there is an agreement on that narrative. And so we have to think that, you know, if we're getting ahead right now, I think that we also have to spend a lot of time um, in ensuring that this is how the narrative is remembered. And that's the work of writing, of testimony, of archiving, of, of, of commemorating, of memorializing, of insisting that we're fighting these repressive battles precisely because of, of how this is going to be remembered and how it's dealt with in terms of accountability. So that's like one thing to think ahead of. And then in ter terms of if you have the capacity and the energy to think farther out, I would encourage, I would encourage folks to, to imagine, to imagine what it's like when we win, because we will win. There is no form of a, this kind of oppression that lasts. Uh, any, any, any entity that commits genocide is committing suicide. It won't last. And so we also have to think in, in, in that moment of victory, hmm. what is it? What is it that we manifest to have the radical imagination to de what is it that we want? How is it that we care for one another? What, do, what how do we organize ourselves politically, socially, economically um, and start, you know, working on that now so that we are we can always be prepared for that moment of victory. We have to always be as if we are victor we have to move in victory and be prepared in order to take charge, to lead, to govern to care, to care for the land, to care for one another um, in, in, in that inevitable future. Well, that was very, very powerful, Noura. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. As Israel attempts to erase the Palestinian people under the cover of darkness, targeting journalists and censoring the press, we must rise from the ashes. At Palestine Deep Dive, we are building a multimedia space where our voices, the Palestinian voices, are always front and center. And right now, we just need 3,000 more of you to join our regular supporters and back our work so we can rapidly expand our output. Help us build the future of journalism. Become a supporter at Palestine Deep Dive com support this is 100% independent media powered by you.